one scripture states in Acts 19, commencing at verse 26, and it turns at verse 28. Acts chapter 9, begins at verse number 26, and ends at verse number 28. And it reads, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them, he had seen the Lord on the road, that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with him at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Peace and blessing to us. Let us pray. The eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we bow this morning to acknowledging your greatness. Knowing that you are God, and besides you, there is no God. Amen. God is thanking you for another day. We realize that it's because of you that we're still numbered among the living, and we're just grateful that you woke us up this morning and started us on our way yes. and enable us to come together to share in another worship service. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity that we come together and we just pray you. Uh, Special blessing upon those who are unable to cause the sickness this morning. We pray in particular for Sister Williams and Trinity who wasn't feeling well this morning. Amen. Pray you bless them and enable them to be able to come at the next appointed time. We pray for all of those who are sick, those that's already been named, those who have been sick for some time. We pray that you will bless them with good health and allow them to experience relief from the pain. And we vow this morning just uh, praying for those who are victimized by the inclement weather. And we just pray and bless them to overcome the difficulties that they've experienced. And we just pray that all will be well with them. We pray this morning for uh, those who are in our neighborhood who are not living as they should. We just okay. pray that you would help us to be examples for Fogo, not only in our neighborhood, but wherever we go. We pray that you would help us to be on our best behavior. Amen. Help us to have a very best conversation with others that we can possibly have. And he, that he will always speak the right things and always do the right things. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for um, those who seem not to be concerned about the lives of other individuals. Amen. We just pray that you would help them to have a change of heart. And we pray this, Heavenly Father, that they every person will have greater regard for human life. Right. And we pray that you uh, allow love, unity, and peace for, to prevail throughout the land and country, throughout each home that represented here today. We pray that love and peace will always be in the church. We pray for the leaders in every congregation. We pray that each person, each individual, have a mind to do all that they can to please you. Pray that the leaders in every congregation will lead in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable to the mm -hmm. But we pray for the uh, members as well, that they will have a desire to follow the leadership. Amen. Help them to achieve the goals that they're set. And we just pray for our community that you would help us to be able to reach out to, to those who are in darkness, those who do not uh, know your will and way. We pray that you would help us to be effective in helping them to understand your will and way. And we just pray for our government officials that we uh, know that there seems to be confusion from the top down, and we just pray that you help men to work together, those who are in Washington and leadership positions, we pray that you will help them to see the need to have the people's best interest at heart. We just pray that you will help them to be able to work together to pull our condition of work. Pray the same for those on the local and state level as well. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, help those who have turned aside and that seem not to be concerned about the soul to see the need to come back and repent before it's eternally too late. Amen. And we just pray that you would be with us as we go further into the worship service. Uh, pray that all the things we say and do will be pleasing and acceptable unto you. We ask forgiveness of our sins, for we realize there are times when we do things that are contrary to your will and way. Right. We just ask that you forgive us. We just pray that when life here is over, that a moment in heaven will wait us. And your son, Jesus.
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Number 49. Number 49. Thank you. 
Everybody let us say amen. amen. Of course, we are truly blessed again to be in the house of Almighty God. How many of you are glad to be here today? Amen. All right. I'm glad that God put in your heart to give him the thanks and praise he so rightly deserves on this here Sunday morning. So glad you all look wonderful and glad to be in your presence as always. I know it's our duty to be here, but it's also our pleasure to be here to give God the thanks and praise that he so rightly deserves. Thank you as well for braving the weather. I know it was raining like cats and dogs, as they say earlier, but that didn't stop us, did it? Because God is worth the struggle of us getting here today. Because again, we wouldn't have any blessings if God didn't give it to us, right? Amen. And of course, we know the greatest blessing is who? Is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. who suffered, died, and rose again, that we may have eternal life. I know it's a silly way of saying it, but I'd rather be a little cold and wet than hot, if you know what I'm talking Amen. about. Amen. When all this said and done. Exactly. It was so interesting that our lesson today with the kids in uh, the elementary Bible school class, Revelation 20, 11, 15. Well, they know that your name has to be written in the book of life Man. in order not to go to H.E.W. Hockey Sticks, also known as the Lake of Fire. Now, I know that if a five- and six-year-old kid can understand that we as adults Man. can understand the urgency of salvation the, and appreciate everything Jesus has done for us to keep us from going unto the wrath of God, if you will. So thank you for caring about your soul. And thank you most of all for caring about Jesus to be here to give him the thanks and praise this morning for what he has done for all of us. Right. Thank you as well if you're visiting here at the Hebrew Street Church of Christ. Again, you are honored guest and want you to feel welcome to continue to worship and fellowship with us once again. And I thank as always my wonderful uh, Lord and Savior for giving my wife for her right. continued love and support. Right. But if you will, go to Acts chapter 9, verse 26 and verse number 28. And prior to us going into too deep with the word right now, I want us to go ahead and make a pact one with another. In other words, you know, just like you have a neighborhood, and I think our brother uh, mentioned some of this in his prayer earlier before uh, we went to this segment of the worship service, that sometimes neighborhoods don't always become the neighborhood you want them to be, right? Amen. You know, a lot of times when you're in a neighborhood, they're pristine when you first get there, right? A lot of times everybody's born on the grass, right? You know, you can go outside. You can sleep with your doors unlocked. All those kind of things. But I don't advise doing that today. Amen. I believe that you need to lock and a padlock plus an alarm a lot of times for some of the neighborhoods that we have come up in, including the one that I grew up in years ago that I would have never thought would become the neighborhood it has become here today, way back in Michigan, not here in Alabama. But what you have to do if you notice something, in many of these neighborhoods, you have to have a neighborhood watch, don't you? Right. In other words, you have to assemble a team in order to try to keep the vandals, to keep the criminals out of breaking into houses. And so if you can understand that your neighborhood and your home is precious, can you understand that the church itself is precious? Amen. And this morning, let's make all a pack together in order to band together as one church in order to be a neighborhood watch for the health of the church. Man. You see, I know that the Bible designates myself as a minister, designates our elders to watch out at, for the flock, but it also tells us to watch out for each other, whether you're a minister, an elder, or a deacon or not, right? Man. In Galatians 6, chapter number 1. So I'm trying this morning to assemble the team to be a neighborhood watch against gossip. Can we do that here today? Man. Can we make a pact in order to try to keep that criminal, that vandal out of the church, if you will? That's what we're going to be talking about here in a moment here. Let's go to Acts chapter 9 before I get ahead of myself. Verse 26 to verse number 28. And I'm going to be reading it from the King James Version. We have that scripture. Somebody say amen. 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 The Bible says, and when Saul, now remember Saul was Paul, right? Before he was converted to Christianity. The Bible says, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. The next verse says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. 
Verse 28, after the concluding verse says, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the springboard scripture, the scripture to get us started out of Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to verse number 28. You've already answered the question that we're going to assemble as a neighborhood watch for the church. But let me ask you another question, which is really our subject here today. And it's simply a challenge to my heart and your heart. When are you going to start sticking up for your brother? When are you going to start sticking up for your brother? As many of you know, let's back up for a moment and get the context of Acts chapter 9 in which we just read. Many of you are familiar, but suffer a little repetition for a moment for those that are not familiar with the story. How many of you remember that Saul was a bad boy Amen. before he became the Apostle Paul? Amen. Again, he would have been one of those type of people that if you just went through a carnal mind, a worldly mind instead of a spiritual mind, you would have come to the conclusion because of his lifestyle that this is somebody God ain't concerned with. This is somebody that God could never have within his fold. This is definitely not somebody that ever called Jesus his Lord and Savior. Why, if you're not spiritual, would you come to that conclusion? Well, his track record wasn't very good, y'all. Think about it this way. When you look at Acts chapter number 7, remember when Paul was part of that angry mob, he consented to the death of the Christian martyr, Stephen. Y'all remember that when those boys were ready to stone Stephen unto his death, the Bible says that Paul held the clothes of the men that were going to stone him. You see, in those days, people were desperate for clothing. So they would come up upon clothing any way they could. And so when you look up the original Greek language that said that he held the clothing, what it means in its context is that he was holding the clothing of the men so they didn't have to worry about nobody stealing their garments as they pelted Stephen to his death with the stones. And so not only was uh, uh, Paul a person that can sit, in other words, gave his vote, would have been one of the ones shouting, kill him, right. take him off the face of the earth, get rid of this man. He was also one that what I call an accessory to murder. Right. Think about it this way. It's almost like a bank robbery. You can go to jail for driving a car, can't you? Amen. You may not have went in there with a, with a bandana on your face. You may not have went in there with a gun. You may not have gave the note to the teller, but you aided the folk. By driving the criminals away, right? And so the same thing with Paul. He aided the folks in the murder of Stephen, and he felt guilty the rest of his life for being a part of that persecution. So again, that's you can see that in Acts chapter 7, verse 54 to verse number 60, where he actually participated in the murder, the consent unto death of Stephen, who was convicted of nothing but preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. In other words, a, a, a innocent man was taken to his death for no apparent good reason at all. So again, folks, he had done nothing wrong, but again, what does it also teach us? That sometimes bad things happen Man. to good people. huh? Man. But again, again, look at the hope. Look what, how, what happened at the end of that chapter. When you look at Stephen, the Bible says that he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus on the right hand of God. Oh, amen, somebody. And then also he said after that, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Oh, this man must have had the heart of Jesus in him in order to say the same thing basically Jesus did while he was on the cross. Amen. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But it also proves another point. You see, if Stephen wasn't a righteous man, if Stephen wasn't walking with God, if Stephen wasn't doing the right thing, he would have never been able to look up to heaven and see Jesus so much, and so many words smiling down on him. Huh? It shows us that Jesus is with us in the prosperity times. He's with us when things are going right, and he's with us when things are not going the way we want them to either. He also proved from that incident with Stephen that he lives up to his earth, where he said, and Lord, I'm with you always, even unto what? The end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 tells us this. So we find out again that, that, that Paul was, was so ugly in his prior days that he even had the blood of a man 
on his hands. So obviously we would think that you no, know, God can save him, but God gonna show us different, is he? When all is said and done. Now we go back again. Paul's uh, 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 bad reputation, his bad track record, even goes even further after the death of Stephen. In other words, he wasn't done yet doing his dirt out in the world, if you want to call it that. You see, folks, remember Paul was notorious for hauling out prison, out to prison, Christians that called upon the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in other words, if this was today, people would be in fear that Paul would be coming through the door. Because Paul was so bad, he was like one of them old bad kids. Y'all grew up in one of them neighborhoods. That somebody was so bad that they would come to your house and try to whoop you too? At your house? Huh? It usually didn't work out too good, amen, amen. when that happened. But Paul was one of them type of men. He would pursue Christians in the synagogues where they were worshiping and drag them out of there in chains. Huh? He was that bad of a boy that he wasn't scared of nothing. You know, that worked to the good in Paul's case later on because that means Paul was stubborn. Paul believed in what he believed in, huh? And that he was a man of action. You see, that's what I tell people. I warn people all the time. Just because somebody is stubborn right now and has to become a Christian don't mean they won't become one later. Amen. And that stubbornness, if you convert that to righteousness, Amen. that's the type of person that will go by Revelation 2 verse 10, where Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You see, there's nothing wrong with being stubborn. But as long as you're stubborn for the right reasons, that's what makes the difference between somebody that can be saved and somebody that can't be saved. But getting back to Paul, y'all still with me here today? Amen. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and verse number 6. Let's go backwards in time. Let's talk about Paul. Obviously, this is after Stephen was killed, but before he was converted. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and verse number 6. I want you to look at some highlights in this passage of Scripture. That's going to help you the rest of your days. Look what it says about Paul, again known as Saul in the days before his conversion. The Bible says, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Let's stop there for a minute. The Bible says what? He was breathing out. Go back to that verse number one for a minute. He was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Guys, what do we need for survival? We need oxygen, don't we? We need to take in oxygen and give back carbon dioxide, as the scientists tell us, right? And so what does that say in symbolic terms? It's saying that Paul spiritually lived on threatening folk and taking them off this earth. In other words, that's what kept him going. Oh, amen, somebody. This is what made him up. His character was all about putting fear in the hearts of Christians and making sure they died where he could. Huh? That's how bad that boy was, huh? Oh, that's terrible when you think about it. I hate to say it, but, you know, we don't even know what the OG really is. That's an original gangster right there, man. Because he really was about killing somebody. Amen, somebody. Let's go back to that verse. And let me read it one more time. It's Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. He went to those in power at that time to gain some power against the Christians. What does the next verse say after that? And desired him letters to Damascus now. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Paul was so bad that he was going to leave his own house. Now, Paul, you're not from Damascus. Huh? Paul, you're not from Jerusalem. But you went to Jerusalem to pursue folk going all the way to Damascus, miles away to the synagogues. In other words, that's where they worshiped at the time, y'all. Right. That was what the church building would have been then, in other words, right? That if he was found any of this way, in other words, if he found any Christian, what was he going to do to him? Whether they were what? Men or women. He wasn't sexist. He'd take a woman out too, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? He might bring them what? Bound. He wanted to arrest them and do what? Throw them in the dungeons or what? Unto yeah. Jerusalem. Oh, amen. Now let's go to the next verse. And as he journeyed, thank God. Thank God God intervened here. Here's where Jesus is going to show up and show him who's false. <laughs> show up and show him. That he is the big man and, and Paul is nothing but the end. Huh? Here's what he said. And as he journeyed, he came near 
Damascus. He didn't quite make it to his destination yet. And suddenly there what? Shine right about him a light from heaven. Amen, somebody. God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. That's showing you the purity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember in Hebrews 4, 14 and 16, the Bible tells us that he was tempted to all points, yet without sin, right? So you're sure you've seen the exalted status. You're not going to see no more Jesus on the cross battered and bloody. When he comes back, he's going to come back as king in all of his glory. So this is the type of thing going on right now. We're seeing the exalted Savior now. The one that had already suffered, died, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. This is the man that's addressing Paul right now. It is all his authority and glory. Look what it says about Paul now. Now, when you're in Jesus' presence, ain't nothing you can do but bow to him. Look at this now. Look what happened with Paul. It said, and he fell to the earth and, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou what? He didn't say persecuted the church. He didn't say persecuting Christians, even though that's what he was literally doing. What did he say? You're persecuting me. Huh? That tells us and encourages us this morning that if anybody mess with us, they're messing with our Lord. Huh? Anytime that we do anything evil to each other, we're doing it to Jesus. Huh? So think about it this way. When you're not compassionate with each other as the body of Christ, you have just told Jesus, I'm not helping you. Huh? Because he takes it personally, right? If we lie on each other, we sabotage each other, if we cheat each other, what do we just do? We have done it unto Jesus himself. He said, we have done these things in Matthew chapter 25, in 31 and 46. We have done these things to the least of these, my brother. You have what? Done it unto me. That's why when I get to the judgment that I want Jesus to be a sit back and say, if I help Brother Terry, thank you for helping me. Huh? I want Jesus to be saying to me that, that if I, I, I honor my marriage unto my death, I want him to say, you are faithful to me because you are faithful to your wife. Because my wife is also my sister in Christ, ain't she? So whatever I do to her, oh, I hope y'all got the y'all quiet on that one there. Whatever I do to my wife, or whatever you do to your husband, sisters, guess who you're doing it to? Jesus the Christ. So if you hit me, she hit me upside my head with a frying pan, she done put a knot on Jesus' head. I'm going to say that next time she get angry too, amen. So I'll get out of trouble, amen. If you know what I'm talking about here today. Now here, go to the first five, back in all our seriousness now. Going back to the encounter of Jesus and Paul the and the uh, future apostle at that time. It says, and he said, who art thou, Lord? Paul is addressing Jesus. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou what? Persecuted. In other words, he repeated himself, right? You're hurting me, right? Look what he said, Jesus in response to Paul. He said, it is hard for thee to kick against the what? Prince. Now again, he's using the agricultural example. He's talking about the ox gold. In other words, that's that pointy stick to keep them going in the fields when you're trying to plow. He said, you're kicking against something that's only hurting you, Paul. You can't kick back against a sharp instrument. He said, you can't kick against me because when you do it, you're hurting yourself. Oh, amen, somebody. Now look at that. Paul must have accepted what he said. Look at verse number six. He said, and he trembling. Mm -hmm. Fear took his heart at that time. See, he had realized that he was messing with the Son of God. Right. He was messing with divinity. And he was humble enough, as bad as he was, to start humbling himself unto Jesus. That's why he started trembling. That's why he was astonished. In other words, he was amazed. It would be like us standing there with our mouth wide open saying, what have I done? Huh? That would have been a shock that took him over. Look what it says. Let's go back to that verse. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord. Now notice what he said. He said, Lord. He was accepting the fact at that point that Jesus is and was what? The Messiah. The Lord and Savior of all mankind. See, about 10 minutes before that event, he would have never called Jesus Lord, right? Never. But see, once you have an encounter with the Lord and your heart is right, Amen. you'll change that attitude right. in a minute, right? See, he was an unbeliever 
an enemy that now had become a believer and friend at this point, right? They say he was saved yet because later on God is going to say, you're going to have to see Ananias, the preacher that's going to tell you what you must do, right? Meaning what you must do to be saved. God, Jesus was just preparing his heart for the word that will save him later on in our story, right? Because you'll see him repeat this story later on, Paul himself. In Acts chapter 22, verse number 16, where he was told, why tarry thou? Arise and be baptized and what? Wash away your sins. Amen, somebody. But Jesus, what was he doing? He was preparing his mind for the change he would have to make in his life. Amen, somebody. So don't run here and say, well, Paul was saying he wasn't saying yet. He was being prepared for salvation. He had to be preached to just like you and me, right? And that's why God was sent out of Nias, because God has chose preaching as the method to save people. Amen, somebody. Amen. That's not the message here today, but I don't want you to go off track, so I had to put that in there for a minute. So again, verse 6 says, and he trembled and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise. What else did it say? And go into the city. And what did it say? It shall be what? Told thee. In other words, the preacher going to come. Which is Ananias. And it shall be told thee what thou what? Must do. In other words, what you must do to be saved. Is that all right, y'all? Y'all still here with me here this morning. But let's move on. And that brings us home here to what we got to get out of this message here today. You see, this brings us to a sad thought as you go later on in, 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 the, in the same chapter, at chapter number 9, on down in the scriptures. You'll find out because of his bad reputation, mm -hmm. because of everything that he had did to the church, because of the people he helped murder, because of the people he helped put in prison, when he tried to come in the church building doors, the folks are saying, and I'm just, just, I don't know what the exact words is. I'm just painting a picture of it was today. Not him. <laughs> he got the nerve to show up here. Oh, amen. Y'all know how some of y'all since put it done. You know, look back here and roll your eyes. Quick. What is this rascal coming in this assembly here before? For? You know, he not welcome here. Some of the brothers have been, 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 been flexing their muscles and saying, you better get ready, bro. You got yours? I got mine. Y'all know what y'all talking about. We might have to do something. Oh, amen. I'm just being honest. Y'all have to praise. Y'all know exactly how you think. He said we might have to defend ourselves. Oh, amen. Before this man leave this assembly. And the first thing y'all going to do is preach you up front. Look what's man up here. I know what y'all going to do. I know exactly what you're going to do. Y'all can't hide behind me. I have a five eight, and y'all in trouble. Something like that here today. But again, on a serious note, you see, because of his background of mistreating the church, the church, when they first encountered him back in Jerusalem, they, they thought that he was disguising himself as a Christian, and they thought he was still trying to hurt the Christian community. So in other words, he was met with rejection instead of acceptance at first. You see, unfortunately, again, even today, members of the Lord's church don't accept everybody. And we'll get in our head and try to get, you know, people try to get in your head and make you think the same way. Oh, amen, somebody. I, I remember a long time ago, a relative of mine, maybe about 16 years ago, he was baptized. And his brother going to tell me, I don't know what he did that for. Mm -hmm. I know he just playing. I know he can't be serious mm -hmm. about this. But you know what? 16 years later, that man, you can't keep him out of church, do Huh? Yes, he came from an ugly background. Man. Yes, he did some things in the street I can't even repeat here. I know his background. I know he did all kind of dirt in the streets for 50 years. But you know what? God can clean up anybody. Man. If he cleaned up Paul, he cleaned up that man. man. He's one of the most faithful men in the flock that I have ever seen in my entire life. Similar background to Paul. Yes, accessory to murder. Oh, I'm being honest with you. All kind of drug and alcohol and all kind of issues. Womenizing things. 
But you know what? That's how much the blood of Christ is effective. Amen. And the word of God can change Amen. somebody. Amen. So don't look at people with prejudice. Amen. You got to understand that some of the worst people make the best Christians. Amen. Jesus said that. You remember when he was talking to the Pharisees? He said, those that have done much uh, will love much. Oh, amen, somebody. That's who you want in the assembly. Because whatever they're dedicated to, you can't shake them from. And when God gets their heart and it's on righteousness, you can't do nothing about it. Amen. Oh, amen, somebody. I thank God for his compassion, his grace and mercy in my life and your life. So some folk, folk, we lean, I'm just making up names here today. A lot of us forget where we came from. Amen. And we'll say crazy things like Brother Williams is not a real Christian. Because I remember when he used to drink more than the fish. Amen. Some members would tell you, you better watch him. He's up to no good. Amen. And I know that. I know that that, that, that that sounds like. Some members would tell you, child, I remember when Sister Gladys, ever since we were children, she was a foul character then, and I believe she is the same now. You see, now, when the church, now here's what you got to love about this situation. Y'all remember y'all committed to be in the neighborhood watching the church? Somebody stood up and became the chairman. Oh, I'm, I'm talking in symbols here, y'all. The chairman was Barnabas. Oh, amen. Did y'all read that? Barnabas stood up for the apostle Paul. Huh? He took him to the apostles, and he demonstrated with his, because of his own eyes of what he saw Paul actually doing, not just saying. The Bible shows us, when you go back to Barnabas, as he was standing up for the apostle Paul, he went to the apostles that were already there at the church in Jerusalem, and he was showing them that Paul was a different man. Mm -hmm. This man now was a true brother in Christ. He now was a real sincere Christian. He went to them and showed them how Paul had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. He went and told them how Jesus spoke to Paul and that Paul was not only living the life of a Christian, but now Paul was preaching, trying to convert people to Christianity through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And from there, the good news on the story is is that the church accepted Paul because only one member, that's all it took. Did you notice that? It only took one member to stand up and defend Paul. And then the church accepted him as a full brother, as they should have all along. Oh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Here today, it only took one person, a one man army, in order to make change in the church. So ask yourself, when is the last time that you defended your brother or sister in Christ? When somebody came with some evil gossip to you? When is the last time you said, well, Brother Williams may have been an alcoholic in the past, but what I see is a transformed man that is more faithful than most members of the church. When is the last time you and I said, well, she used to be that way, but all that I see now is a devoted mother a sincere Christian and a woman that is not afraid to lift her voice and praise unto God as she used her gift of singing to uplift the name of the Lord. Right. I guarantee you that there will be more peace in the church universally everywhere if the members stop being jelly bats, I like to call them. In other words, cowards. And start standing up to the gossiper and say, if you're going to keep talking this way, you want to go talk to somebody else. I'm not here to receive all that negativity. You want to be negative to somebody else or to the wall. Or change, and I'll receive you again. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. This is part of being the neighborhood watch of the church. That we got to send the gospel back in. Amen. If he or she is not going to change. Oh, amen, somebody. And do the right thing. You see, again, when you're sitting back there, and you're listening to that, somebody speaking, you have become the accessory to murder. Man. Huh? Because anytime what? You help mess up somebody's reputation? Right. You spiritually murder. Huh? Man. Anytime you have become a hater yourself, the Bible literally says 
You are a murderer and there's no eternal life. Right. Huh? That's waiting for you. You got to stand up and tell somebody, I'm not listening to this mess. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. And you got to keep that to yourself. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11. If we really do it this right, here's what we're supposed to do. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 is actually uh, written to the church. And it's talking about internal church stuff. Mm -hmm. Huh? Look what the Bible says. The Bible is showing us overall that we can't be an anything goes church. You can't just let sin go and just turn your head Amen. as if nothing is happening. Right. This is what Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is trying to tell the church. Don't you dare tolerate sin in the camp. Do something about it. Here's what he says. He says, but now I have written unto you to what? Not. You see that not there? Now he's talking about church members with church members. You got it? Look what he says. But now I have written unto you not to what? Keep company. In other words, don't you keep associating with folk that don't know how to act in the church. He says, if any man that is called a what? He didn't say a man in the world. So that tells you right there the context of the church, right? He said, if any, if any man that is called a brother be a what? Fornicator, a player, in other words, trying to run through all the girls in the church, you know what I'm talking about. They'll be around him, right? Or what? Covetous, he's greedy, trying to always scam somebody, get away from him. The Bible says, or an idolater, in other words, he's trying to live two religious lives, right? He's trying to be a Christian and do yoga. Yes, I said that. He's trying to be a Christian and, and worship Buddha and any other kind of stuff. He says, what? Or an idolater, what is he supposed to do? Don't keep company. He said, what? Or a railer. That's the one you keep under your belt. That's the one we're really talking about. A railer means somebody that slanders other folks' name. It means a gossiper. He's saying, what? With the gossipers, even in the church, what do you say? Get away from them, right? Or an extortioner or a drunkard, all then what? God said what? With such a one, no, not what? To eat. Get away from them. Because why? What does God say the consequence is for you? He said evil communication does what? Corrupt good matters. You will become what you hang around. Oh, amen, somebody. So he's saying, get away from them. Otherwise, Satan got you both. If you don't repent on the judgment day. Well, I wasn't saying much on the phone. I was just listening. He still got you. Because why? You're keeping gossip going. Oh, amen, somebody. I think even a kid can understand what we're saying right here today. So God is bluntly saying, to summarize that, if someone is a railer, which means one that speaks evil about others, then do not associate with that person. You see, as long as the gossipers are allowed to gossip with us and speak evil of others, then there will remain drama in the church. Man. There will remain drama in your life. Because if you don't know this by now, if they're talking about somebody else, they're talking about you too. Man. Be smart enough to figure that one. Man. Oh, amen, somebody. And as long as we continue to fellowship with gossipers, too many souls will be discouraged and walk away from Christ to their own eternal doom. Right. As we come closer to the reckoning, of my mom was off your toes this morning. Let's take in the idea that although we as Christians are to defend our brothers and sisters in Christ, the one being accused makes sure you're defendable. Oh, I don't think you got it. In other words, don't put nobody out on the line if you know you ain't right. Hmm. Yeah. If you're not acting right, don't let nobody go out on a limb for you. Oh, amen, somebody. You see, some folks want to play that game. They'll throw the rock and hide behind the bush. I ain't doing it. Then they want somebody to defend them. When all is said and done, don't do that. See, I'm telling you, I'm not going to be caught in that one no more. You know, I've been in that situation before. Defending the brother. Brother, that's going to just run his mouth all the time. I'm not talking about him in the street here. And, 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 and then he, I mean, he, we got him up one time. For real. I'm talking about at a brother, a, a meeting, a whole bunch. It was probably like 10, 15 of us sitting there. And they going off on the brother. Amen. And I'm sitting down like, yo, y'all know y'all ain't supposed to be doing that. 
You ain't, you, don't, you know, this ain't God's way. You're supposed to take this one on one. They were starting to go off on me at that point. Amen. 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 I ain't going to lie to you. One thing I was right about, if you have an argument against your brother, Matthew 18, 15, 18, you're going to take it to him one on one. You ain't supposed to let it build up in you like a stick of dynamite. And then everybody go off on me. They ain't doing right. I was right about that part. But man, I tell you, about a week later, the brother did the same thing again. I had to just lay my head down like, what did you do that for? Huh? Now he got me looking crazy. Huh? At that point. You know, so again, folks, if you're not right, don't put nobody else in your mess. Huh? You clean that stuff up on your own first, right? And then when you're right, then we'll stand up for you. We'll make sure your heart is right. Then you're going to have a whole bunch of Barnabases on your side. Amen, somebody? Amen. And we'll stand together as a collective front in order to preserve your reputation. Amen. But make sure it's a reputation that should be preserved. Amen. And that you're not trying to be some type of shyster in the church. Can I say that, Amen. And be defendable. Remember, look at what Barnabas did. Acts chapter 9, verse 27 and 28. As I conclude. You see, Barnabas, I mean, excuse me, Paul was defendable. Because what did Barnabas say? Look at this, verse 27, 28. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen, right? Barnabas was his witness that he was changed. The Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had what? Preached boldly at Damascus. Remember, he went to arrest folks at Damascus. But he had changed, right? Now he's trying to bring them into Christ instead of jail. Is that all right now? Into salvation instead of damnation. The Bible says that how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them going in and out at Jerusalem. In other words, that means they accepted him at that point. But again, it only took one man to stand up, right? You see, are you willing to stick up for your brother? Amen. You see, as we conclude here, I just want to challenge you one more time, now that you've heard the lesson. Now that you've heard the word of God, now that you've seen by example what we're supposed to do, are you ready to stand up for your brother when you have done the right thing? Are you ready to be the neighborhood and watch to keep gossip out of our midst, huh? Are you ready to hang up the phone when the gossiper calls, huh? Are you ready to tell him or her, I'm not listening to this nonsense any further because it's an ungodly situation? In an ungodly conversation, I won't have no parts of this. Are you strong enough not to be a jelly bag, as I learned here now about? Or are you strong enough to stand up and be the man or woman you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus? I'll let that challenge be on your own heart, and you have to answer for that unto God yourself. See, if you're a child of God, and you walk the sword, you know it's time to be restored. You know you still serve the merciful and loving God that has written to us in Acts 8, verse 22. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, verse 10. That if you're a Christian that has fallen short, God says you have to repent. In other words, change. Confess your fault to him and ask him to forgive you. He's going to forgive you right then and there. He's going to act like nothing has happened. Isn't that a beautiful attitude that God has for us? Don't you want to tap back into that grace and mercy? You can do it if you take care of what you're supposed to do. Get back right with God. But if you're not a child of God, don't let this opportunity pass you by. You have to understand that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming up to the Father but by me. Yes, you have heard that the church has problems. Yes, it does. But you also see the good part of the church, right? When God's word goes forward, they actually change. Is that all right now? There's no organization of anybody that you can go to that's perfect on this earth. Huh? If you go to your job, you're going to run into some folk that ain't going to be right. Huh? If you go to the post office, you're going to run into some folks that's not going to be right. Amen. You go to the store, you're going to, go, you're going to run into folk that's not going to be right. You can watch TV, radio, you're going to find that. But the problem is, it's so interesting, that even though you may be wrong at the store, if they still got a good sale, you go back to that store. <laughs> huh? Think about it. You may have got ticked off by a, a, a talk show. They had a guest you didn't like, but if they have your hero coming on, you're going to still watch that talk show. Huh? I never understood why the church is the only place people will not forgive. Amen. It's hypocrisy. Amen. It's hypocrisy. 
It's the only place you'll see on earth that if something happened, I'm, I'm gone. I don't even think you're y'all no more. You see, you see, you still go to your job and get a paycheck even though everything ain't right there. Amen. Huh? See, but the difference in the church, think about it this way, is first uh, is Second Peter chapter one, verse five to verse number eight. God is always in the process of perfecting the church. Amen. In other words, the church is going to continue to get better. Right. Your job will probably get worse. Mm -hmm. huh? The stores are going to get worse. Right. Television is going to get worse. Radio is going to get worse. You see, you have a better chance of being happy in the church than anywhere else. Amen. Despite, despite his faults. You have to understand something. Hebrews 12 is in the Bible for a reason. God said, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. In other words, God is our father. And a good father is going to discipline his child Amen. from time to time. Because why? Not because he hates him, but because he loves him. Amen. Think about it this way. A good father is not going to just let you go out in the street and you and your parents, you don't know what you're doing. Because a car will hit you in a minute. So what he's going to do, he's going to grab you, he's going to spike you so you realize don't go past this boundary so that you don't get hurt. It's the same thing in the church. God is going to tell you some things that you want to hear. He's going to tell you some things that you don't want to hear. But in the end, they serve, both serve the same purpose, to show you that he loves you and he wants you to make it to heaven. Amen. We're not going to say it. Now. So what do you got to do in order to be saved? God laid that down. Within his Bible. It's in several books of the Bible, but you have to put them all together to get the truth. You can't have half the truth and be saved. You gotta have the whole truth in order to be saved. That's why Paul said, I have not I ceased, as I paraphrase it, to deliver unto you the whole counsel of God. In other words, you gotta know everything in order to be saved. And what is that plan of salvation in its entirety? It's in Romans, it starts with Romans 10, verse 17. That you gotta hear the word of God. The Bible says, Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. What is that word of God that God wants us to understand? Well, he starts in John chapter 3 verse 16 to keep it simple. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus continues. Now, that's not all the plan of salvation. He also talks about repentance. You have to understand something. Revelation 20. Verse 11 to verse number 15 talks about being cast into hell as the second death. Jesus gives us a commandment in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5 in order to, uh, to avoid that second death. He says you must repent or you shall likewise perish. In other words, before you can be forgiven of your sins, before you can be saved, you have to make it up in your mind that you're going to live righteously and live a sinful lifestyle alone. Then you have to, as a part of the South plan of salvation, confess Jesus literally as the Son of God. In other words, Jesus on this earth wants you with your mouth. He wants you to take ownership of him, and when you do that, when you get to the judgment day, he's going to make, take ownership of you. You'll see that all over the passage of Scripture. You'll see that Revelation, excuse me, Romans 10, verse 9 and verse 10, Acts 8, verse 37, Matthew 10, verse 32, and verse number 33 all show us we must confess Jesus as a son of God and our Lord in order to be saved. But you can't just talk to talk. you got to walk to walk. Amen. You see, talking to talk is confession. Walking to walk is baptism right. after that because that's also part of the plan of salvation. What does baptism do, do for you? God said it in several passages of Scripture. He said in Acts chapter 22, verse number 16, we talked about it earlier. Why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You see, when God sees you obeying him by going down in the water, that's when he decides to forgive you of all the sins you have committed in your life. It also does another thing. Galatians 3 verse 27 says, those that have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. Being in Christ is the same thing as being a member of the church. Being in Christ means you're a child of God. That's when you're added to the family of God. So you see two benefits right there of being baptized. You know, first of what? Washes away your sins. 
It adds you to the family of God and it also saves you according to Mark 16, verse 16, where Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You see, once you come out of that water, get out of that thing rejoicing, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter number 8, knowing that the grace and mercy of God has been put in your life. You have been showered, showered, that is, with forgiveness. You have been given the greatest gift on earth of salvation at that point. And you've got to stay faithful unto death after you become a Christian. Revelation 2, verse number 10, completes the plan of salvation. Where Jesus said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Faithful means stay committed to what you started. Amen. Keep believing, obeying everything until the end of your life. And heaven's going to be your home at that point. What we do to give you an opportunity to be saved is just sing a song. The song is not designed to save you, nothing like that. The song is to give you an opportunity to come down that aisle. Give me your hand and guard your heart. And we'll ask you that simple question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And we'll go down in the water together. Where you go down your old self, but you'll rise a new creation. All your sins will be washed away. You'll be added to the family of God. You'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. Won't you come as together we stand and sing the Lord's name? Won't you come? Lovely and tender, Jesus is calling. Amen.